Hi guys. This is the notes for section 2.3, which is going up for Wednesday's class and the homework assignment, homework number six, which accompanies this set of lectures will be due Friday by 1 p.m. before our live Zoom class. Okay, let's get started. Here we go. All right, so in section 2.3, now that we've been talking about different numerical systems, we now have uh, the one that we are most familiar with, which is the numerical system that we use. And sorry while I try to uh, shut down some of these background things so that you guys get a clear view. Okay. Um, we now get to talk about our numerical system, the one that you're most familiar with, the one that you would be teaching to your elementary school students. And we're going to be able to look at it from the perspective of the numerical systems that we've already discussed and also be able to see some of the similarities and comparisons. And in the end, be able to determine why it is that we have used this system because it turns out that in comparison to the ones we've discussed, it's the most efficient, allows us to do calculations uh, most easily and effectively and still contain some of the pluses that we found in the other numerical systems we discussed, such as having additive properties, subtractive properties, and um, being able to have place value so that we can then use it for large uh, numerical quantities. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Our system is called the Hindu Arabic system. That is a number system that we use. And as you can see here, it was um, developed around 800 BC. So it was slightly contemporaneous to some of the other systems we discussed that were developed um, early on in uh, the current era, CE. Sorry, I said BC before, my mistake. All right, so let's look at some of the features. Some of the features of our system is that it contains the following. It contains digits, right? Uh, the digits zero to nine, and out of those uh, 10 digits, we make all the numbers in our number system, all right? And that's why they can be used to represent all possible numbers in existence. It, um, it really is quite ingenious and useful. Um, it is based on 10, so we do use our place value or our groupings, like we use in the tally system, we group them by fives. Um, and even like in the Roman numeral system, which is based on 10, but they didn't do groupings, we do groupings. And one, for example, we have 10 ones, okay, which, oh, sorry about that. Hold on. 10 ones, which when grouped together, create one 10. And then when we have 10 tens, when grouped together, we have 100. You may be familiar with those base 10 blocks that um, are generally used to teach this concept. And so usually in this concept, we have the, the little individual squares are the ones, okay? And then when you have a little bar that has 10 squares in it, that represents a 10. And then you have the, what we call the flat, which in essence is equivalent to having 10 of these bars. And obviously this is not gonna be true to size, but you understand where I'm going with. And then obviously it's got 10 rows going this way. So it really represents 100 individual ones or 10 of these bars together, we call that the 100, right? You guys have seen this. And then we even have the cube, which basically represents 10 of these flats being put together because we've got 10 columns, right? And presumably there are 10 rows that work their way all the way back into the cubes. The idea is that you're supposed to assume the cubes are solid and so therefore you basically have 10 flats stacked one on top of the other, although usually in the sets that you have as teachers, they're not solid. But the, con the conception is there. And then these are what we call our thousands, right? 
These groupings that we're discussing here are what we're referring to here in the grouping by tense, okay? You can also look at some figures in 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, giving you some different examples on how you can teach this concept of grouping with these base 10 blocks and a couple other potential manipulatives. You can find those figures in this section of your textbook. Oh, excuse me, something's in my eye here. My apologies. Okay, but because we can, we do this grouping by tens, we now have the positional quality that some of the other numerical systems we looked at have, where depending on where the digit is placed, it gives it its value. You guys already know this, that the three digit based in the ones place is worth just three, but if we were to put it in the tens place, it's now worth 30. If we put it in the hundreds place, 300, so on and so forth. And again, you can see here, some more figures that talk about chips and abacus tools as being wonderful ways of discussing place value, okay? Now, in our number system, we have what's called, it's additive, right? Remember that we did talk about numerical system, uh, the Roman numeral system, which was additive and subtractive. Our number system is both additive and multiplicative, all right? And what that means is that the value of the number, the numeral, is found by multiplying each of the place values where it is, where it's corresponding, and then adding all of them together to create the actual numeral. So for example, the same example that we, we saw earlier, right? Each digit, depending on the place value where it's placed, gives it its value. And we would, in expanded form, you see here, we have the three in the ones place. So we would do that three times one. That's the multiplicative portion of it being an additive um, numerical system. Then we have the two here that is placed in the tens place. And that means that we're taking that two and multiplying it by 10, meaning it's actually worth 20, right? So there's the additive version. You see it in green. In the black that I'm highlighting, you see the multipl multiplicative portion of this, all right? We have the, hundred, the five that's in the hundred, so that really means five times 100 or 500, right? And then we have the six that is in the thousands right here, which is really means six times a thousand, okay? Or 6,000, right? And this is how we usually teach what we call expanded form. And it usually gets taught in conjunction when we're looking to teach place value and understanding of place value. You can see the little note that I made you here that these two ways of writing it, either in just the additive portion of it or using the mul multiplicative portion as well as the additive allows you to see um, this place value and added and multiplicative property of our numerical system. Okay, so now, how do we name our numbers? And that is one of the things that in our system is both uh, unique and also can sometimes be complicated for students, okay? We name our numbers as follows. And these are the rules, some of the rules that you should remember. In naming our numbers, we name them, okay, by following the following rules. From zero to 12, they all have a unique name. Each number has been given its own unique name that has never been used before. Once we pass 12 in those numbers, we call them the teens because they, we take a portion of the earlier name that was introduced and add the word teen to it. For example, if you see here, okay, we take four, which was introduced originally in the original set of numbers, we add the word teen to it and create the name for this number, which is 14, okay? Then if we move on to the numbers starting at 20 and all the way up to 100, the rule we use there is that we use the combinations of names that were earlier, but then we reverse them with the tens and the first place value. Here's what we mean. We then now, up until now, we've been taking the number and adding something to it to create a name for in teens, right? Take four, add teen, 14. Or previous to that, everything had a unique number. Now we get to 20 all the way up to 99, and we in essence take the tens place and name it first, 
So because there's two in the tens place, that's a 20. And then we take the ones place and name it second. And because there's two in the ones place, that's two. And that's how we come up with the number 22. This right here is the area that most young students in elementary school will struggle with because the naming that we gave them all the way up through 19 followed a predictable pattern. Then we get to the 20s and it doesn't follow that predictable pattern anymore. Now we've changed how we do it. Okay. Now, what is helpful about how we do it here in this third section is that we name the number and then it's addition. So we read it from left to right. And that is very helpful to young students. So you might find that some students struggle with the teens more than they struggle with numbers in the section three here of 20 to 99. Okay, because we say 22. So everybody remembers take a 20, take a two, put them together. We say 93, take a 90, take the three, put them together. We read them from left to right. We've named them from left to right. However, with the teens, that isn't always the case and it becomes confusing for students sometimes. For example, uh, and that is one of the reasons why you'll see them sometimes switch things because we do 13, right? And they're not necessarily, there's no numerical value really um, connected to the word teen. The word teen is supposed to make them remember that they should put a one in front of that third that they were hearing, right? And that becomes confusing to them sometimes. So understanding these two ways that we name our numbers can some help you to identify where a student might be struggling early on in elementary school years when they're having a difficult time knowing how to name their numbers or keeping track of them, okay? Now, once we get to the 100s, from 100 to 1,000, right, you just use uh, an earlier name. So, for example, and here's our example here. In our example, we have the number 538. We literally just name it from left to right. So, again, this is an area where if the students hadn't struggled in the numbers 20 to 99, they're not going to struggle too much when they get to the hundreds, okay? They're going to go, all right, it's 500, and then this is 30, and then this is 8. 538. It makes it a little easier. 5 being an earlier name, 100 just denoting the place value where it's sitting. Okay, 38, also an earlier name, but again, we have 30 plus 8, so those are the earlier names. So these are all named with names that we've already known, and they're just in the order that we see them, so it makes it a little easier for students to understand that portion, okay? Finally, in numerals that contain more than three digits, we basically just group them, and that's the important part. We group them in groups of three, that we set off by commas. These groups are often called periods, okay? So the first group up to the first three digits, we call that the hundreds period. The second three digits that are separated by commas, we call that the thousands period. And then, you know, the next one is the millions and so on and so on and so on. And you can see here, I've highlighted it for you again, we call these groups that are offset by commas, we call them periods, okay? Something to note, students generally have to learn these three key concepts in order to be able to understand our numerical system. So these concepts have to be taught before you can even teach them how to do calculations with our number system. It's why this information is usually taught to students in kindergarten. Um, we even introduce some of it in preschool in gentle kinds of ways. And we really strongly hit it at the start of first grade before we introduce concepts like addition, subtraction, multiple digit addition and subtraction and so forth. Because they must have a strong understanding of the concepts of the digits that we use and the way that we name them and then how we group them in place value order and what place value is before they're really ready to work with numbers. So in order to fully understand the concept of our number system, students need to be able to not understand that the number is a, the numeral is a symbol. They also need to understand that the name of it, the word name of it, is another way of representing it, and that both the symbol and the word name represent the quantity that we want to use.
okay? So we use both of these to help represent our quantity. So for example, okay, the numeral 35, this would be the numeral part, and the word name 30 and five, sorry that that's so sloppy. Let me try to do that a little bit better for you. Okay, and the name 30, five, both of them, both the numeral and the name, both of these denote the quantity of 35 of something. And this whole concept is where the students must be solid in order to then be able to move on to do calculations, okay? So how, we're now going to look at a concept of a numerical system that is similar to the Hindu system for the purposes of helping you understand how your students feel when you first introduce them to all these concepts that we just finished discussing about our numerical system. So when you first introduce them to place value, okay, like we talked about up here and the fact that we group them by tens, and then you introduce them to how we do expanded form of that place value to help us understand why each of these groupings have names. And then you explain things like how we, name these numerical symbols that represent these quantities, how we name them from 0 to 12 and from 13 through 19, from 20 to 99, and from 99 and you know from 100 to 999. And then you explain that each of these groupings are periods and that there is a meaning to that so that you can finally make sure that your students have mastered this idea that what we name and the numeral or the symbol we use for it and the way we state it, all of it together represents quantities that can be mathematically used, okay? That can be very confusing for young minds that have never thought about these concepts before. So here is a way that you can get a sense of how that works. And we're going to use a little bit of the information that you've already learned from previous numerical systems to also help you work with this, okay? So here's what we're doing. We are going to use, sorry, let me try to resize this so you can see this. We're going to use what's called base five, okay? Meaning that we're going to use all the same symbology as we're already accustomed to in our number system, which is based on 10, but we're going to translate it to a number system if everything was based on five. Okay, so for example, okay, and we're, we can still use those same block concepts, but just think of, a, of it this way, the single blocks represent one at a time, but the bar does not represent 10, it now represents five, okay? The flat no longer represents 100, it represents, okay, 25. Five of those bars grouped together into the flat. And the cube no longer represents a thousand, but rather it represents 125, okay? So these are still ones in base 10, but the bars are now fives, okay? The flats are now 25s, and the cubes are now 125, okay? This is a comma here. You know what? Let me fix that so that you can read that a little better. 25. Okay. And I'll get rid of this right here too. So as not to confuse you. There you go. So that is the, con the, the construct. Now here's how you would work with it. And please pay attention to this. You are going to do homework that requires you to do use this very example that we're discussing now in the notes. And this problem always shows up on the unit test for this section, okay? So it's important that you understand and can follow along with what's happening here um, so that you can make sure to, uh, to use it. And the purpose of it is because you having to think this way will help you to better understand how your students are thinking when you, when you introduce them to our numerical system. And therefore may you, make you more capable of diagnosing where they're getting lost and what you can do to help them understand, okay? So if we wanted to represent the quantity of three in base five, we would use three ones. So you'll notice that in our number system, base 10, three and three are the same, okay? 
However, if we wanted to represent 14 in base five, that would mean that you would need to use one five, okay? Because this means one five. Remember that in the place value for base five, we have ones, fives, 25s, right? And let me, uh, let me find a better way to illustrate that. I'm going to slide this over here. In our base 10 system, we name our place value as ones, ones, tens, hundreds, right? Thousands. In base five, we name our place value, and I'm gonna put that over here, as ones, fives, 25s, 125. Uh, I don't think you're going to be able to see this. Let me erase this and come a little closer. We do it ones, fives, 25s, and 125. Okay? So when you place a digit here, you're really saying take that digit and multiply times five. When you place a digit here, you're saying take that digit and multiply times one. You put it here, you're saying take that digit and multiply times five. You put it here and you're saying take that digit and multiply times 25. You put it here and you're saying take that digit and multiply times 125. Just like when over here in our base 10, you put a digit here and you're saying take that digit, multiply times one. When you put it here, you say take that digit, multiply times 10. If you place it here, you're saying take that digit, multiply times 100. And you put it here, and you're saying take that digit, multiply times 1,000. Hopefully that's clear for you, okay? So when we're, uh, so I'm gonna erase that, and now I'm gonna have you go back to what we were talking about here in base five. So when we write the number 14 in base five, if you can imagine your place value, that means that you've taken your ones, and you've put a four in it, and you've taken your fives and you've put a one in it, okay? So that would mean taking one times five, which is five, and taking four times one, which is four, you add them together in our numerical system, 14 in base five is equal to nine in our numerical system. Let's do another one, okay? So that you can understand it. I'm gonna erase my scribbling here so as to not make it difficult for you to follow. We're gonna do it in red now. Let's look at this one, okay? If we wrote the number 132 in base five, okay? The blocks we would use to represent it would be a flat, right? Because we have 125, right? 125. We have three fives and we have two ones. This, think of this as ones, if you're doing your little place value mat, right? Fives and 25s. So then using the additive multiplicative um, facet of base five, which is exactly as it exists in base 10, except for we're using base five, right? You would then say, okay, so if I've got two ones, that's two times one, that's two. If I have three fives, okay, and I'm gonna erase this down here so as to not complicate things for you. Okay, so this was two, three, one. Two ones, three fives, 125. So if we have two ones, that's two times one, that's two. If we have three fives, that's three times five, that's 15, right? If we have 125, that's one times 25, that's 25. If we add that together, 25 plus 15 plus two, 25 
plus 15 plus 2 is a total of 42. So 132 in base 5, and that's why we write this in that lowercase to let us know what we're talking about, is equal to 42 in base 10. Okay, let's do one more. Hopefully this is helping you to understand and not just making you more confused. But by all means, feel free to reach out um, or ask about this in our live session on Friday. All right, so I'm gonna get rid of all my scribblings here so as to make it easier for you. Okay, and less distracting. Let's say that once again, we are talking about this number in base five. If we represent this number using base five blocks, I'm saying I have four ones, so there they are, right? Four ones. I'm saying I have zero fives, so you'll notice I have no five bars here. I have zero 25, so you'll notice I have no 25 flats here. And then I have one 125, and so there it is. This is the 125, right? I have four ones, I have one of these, and zero for the place values in between. So I would then, to convert to our numerical system, which is base 10, would go, okay, four ones, four times one is four. And I would say 125 times one is 125, and plus zero, plus zero, but we know that that doesn't change anything. So 125 plus four together give me 129. So 1,004 in base five is equal to 129 in our group, okay? Finally, so remember the following. Remember that five ones, so five individual ones, is equal to one five or a bar, okay? And that five bars, so five of the bars together, is equal to 125 or a flat. And five flats together, so you take five of the flats together, the big ones, okay, is equal to one cube or 125. And that's what these little numbers will help you remember, okay? The equivalent of, and here is how we use it in our base 10, right? 10 individual ones give you one 10 bar. 10 tens or 10 of those bars together give you the flat or 100. And 10 hundreds or 10 of those flats together give you the cube, which is a thousand. Okay. All right. Now, last but not least, in a ditch effort to make sure that you understand, okay, if we were to write this using the place value mat, 42, we would write it as two ones, four tens, right? 132 in base five is two ones, three fives, 125. If you write it in expanded form, this is four times 10 plus two times one, or 40 plus one, sorry, plus two, which equals 42, okay? Now, if we do the same thing over here, this would be written in expanded form. This would be one times 25, right? Plus five times three plus two times one, okay? Which is 125 plus 15 plus two, which equals 132, okay, in base five. And by writing that small subscript is how we say that it is in base five. Does everybody follow? Hopefully. You do. If not, please be sure to ask me questions in classes. This is a concept I want to make sure that you understand. But if you struggle with it and it's mind boggling to you, please remember that this is exactly how your students feel when they're being exposed 
to the concept of place value and the fact that our numbers are base 10 and how we number them and how we name them. They feel the same way. They get all the same confusions that you're going to experience here. Okay. Now your homework is on page 76. You're going to do numbers one through seven and that homework will be due by 1 p.m. on Friday right before we log on to our live session. Then immediately after our live session, you will see that you will have a video and homework notes for the lecture for Friday, which will then of course in turn be due on the following Monday. All right, have a great night. And then we're gonna go ahead and stop our share right here. And I hope that you have a wonderful evening.